All right. Um, so again, these slides are, are freely available to, for you to use, dispense, um, with the caveat being that please credit where credit is due. All right, so introduction to cancer genomics. Um, when I was told that this was the session I'd be giving, uh, I was a little confused. That's a pretty broad category. Um, and I know that we all come from a diverse background. Uh, many of us have been in cancer for many years. Many of us are more come from the software side of things. Uh, so the way I've broken it down, and this is kind of how I see cancer genomics, is that um, it kind of falls into three main pillars. Uh, there's an aspect of technology, technology development, technology advances that have enabled a lot of the research that's going on now. Um, then there's the discovery, so applying this technology uh, to tumors and so on. Uh, and then finally, the third pillar would be then trying to use this information and use this research to actually make some sort of clinical progress. Um, so what I've done, we have an hour and a half. Uh, I think I've, high, I've picked, and, picked and chosen you know, what I think are interesting from these three different categories. Um, but feel free, if someone has particular questions or things you want to talk more about, feel free to do it. We don't have to get through all of the slides. Or if you just want me to rent, get through all the slides really quickly, we can finish in 45 minutes, we can do that too. So this is up to you. Um, I mentioned earlier, my background is primarily in, in the first and third. Um, you know, I, I come from a, a technology background. Uh, I've worked with microarrays, next-gen sequencing for a number of years. Uh, I've used them for cardiovascular medicine. Uh, and now in the last few years, I've been applying them here at OICR and, and working in the field of cancer. Um, so I'll talk about a little bit about applying these. And then the, uh, obviously, I'll, I'll finish with some, some thoughts on applying technology and, and kind of the state of, of clinical cancer medicine and using genomics. Um, so here's a bit of an overview of what we'll talk about. Um, with technologies, I guess most of us are here because of, of next-gen sequencing, and so I'll, I'll highlight kind of the, the key players, some of their capabilities and applications. I'll also talk about some of the, the downsides of, of some of these technologies. I'll mention briefly, uh, I'll go into some microarrays, only because I know uh, later in the week you guys are going to deal with some microarray data, uh, particularly expression data, so I'll, I'll just mention them um, a little bit. Uh, then we'll talk about some challenges that, that can cancer genomics research faces, uh, particularly things like heterogeneity, uh, tumor cellularity, purity, ploidy, things like that. Um, I'll talk about some highlights of the past couple of years, some major advances in the field. Um, I think things that I, really, I've picked some projects that I find interesting, uh, and hopefully you will as well. And then I'll talk a little bit about kind of where, the, where I see the future going, um, things like single cell sequencing. Um, looking at liquid biopsies, circulating tumor cells, circulating for DNA, and some clinical integration. So if we start looking at kind of DNA sequencing technology, for the better part of, you know, the last 20, 25 years, nothing really changed. Um, you know, things we went from using radioactive labeled nucleotides to fluorescently labeled nucleotides, uh, running them on big gels to then uh, automating this process and running them in capillaries. Uh, but, but really nothing changed. The chemistry was the same. And it required these giant factories of, uh, of these automated capillary-based sequencers to sequence things like the human genome. Uh, and they could do 200 million bases a day. And you know, that's why those projects took a billion dollars and you know, many, many years to just sequence in a single human genome. But then about nine years ago, there was kind of this giant revolution in sequencing technology. And people started thinking about new ways to interrogate DNA, uh, generating crazy amounts of data. Uh, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with, with this, this plot here. Um, it looks at the cost to sequence a megabase of DNA uh, and just plotting this over time. And you can see that you know, around the time where the analysis switched from a Sanger capillary-based method to these next-gen technologies, the cost has just plummeted. Um, it's sort of plateaued. And if anything, it's, it's gone up a little bit in the past year or so, but it, you, know, the, you can see that you know, the, the, the possibility of sequencing an entire genome just was unimaginable uh, unless you had you know, a giant um, consortium like was done for the Human Genome Project. But now you know, we routinely sequence you know, hundreds of genomes every month. So you know, there's many advantages of, of these next-gen platforms. Obviously, um, you know, we're not making back libraries or subcloning things and, and just to sequence a single stretch of DNA. Um, the amount of data we're generating is such that 
Um, it's quantifiable just by simply counting the data that is being generated. Um, that I, I think the biggest advantage is that the technology has gotten so good and so efficient at producing DNA that it's actually adaptable to, to many different applications. And so if you have a particular uh, interest in biology, if you can translate your signal into a DNA signal, you can then interrogate it with the DNA sequencing technology and generate really high quality and, and vast amounts of data. Um, we'll touch on a little bit of that later. Um, and then obviously that you know we're generating tons of data at a reduced cost. So the initial trend of this of this um, kind of revolution of sequencing well, it was really like an, a quote unquote arms race. Uh, the technology providers were trying to produce more data, cheaper, faster, get longer reads, um, and that's what what gave us things like, um, which I'm sure you're familiar with, four five four sequencing, uh, Illumina G or Selexa sequencing, um, which eventually became Illumina um, and AV Solid. But the bottom line is that all sequencing technologies um, that in this category rely primarily on the same principle that you know DNA genomic DNA is 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 fractionated or sized or sized into smaller fragments, uh, and then some sort of adapter is ligated onto the end of that. That adapter can then bind to some sort of surface on the instrument, and then whatever chemistry is used can then, uh, you know, incorporate a polymerase and extend uh, and read th th those strands. They're, it's all roughly the same. Um, I guess the, the biggest player in the market, obviously, right now is, is Illumina, and I think most of the data that you'll be using in, in the in this week will be generated on Illumina HiSeq machines. And so this is just kind of a table to, to go over um, kind of the, the current state of the instruments. There's actually been a recent chemistry upgrade that these numbers are, are probably about a month or two old. But, you know, we can generate, you know, 200 bases of sequencing data in a single run. Um, you know, uh, these machines rely on glass flow cells that are loaded on. There's lanes. It takes 10, 11 days to run. Uh, one of these flow cells in the standard mode, we're generating somewhere in the order of 600 uh, gigabases to now probably closer to a terabase of sequencing data uh, in that time. And then obviously, um, the company has released other instruments that are rely on the same chemistry, the same flow cell based chemistry, uh, but produce varying amounts of data. So you have things like the MySeq that's probably equivalent to uh, an eighth of a HiSeq, uh, the NextSeq that's probably about you know, uh, well, similar to running it in the rapid run, where it runs a, a quick run, you generate a fraction of the data, but it can be uh, done quickly. And then you have their, their high seq Xs that, you know, are producing probably two or three times the amount of data that uh, the normal high seq is, uh, with the caveat is that they're only capable of sequencing human DNA. Um, so quickly, I just thought I, I'd put up this slide. This is from Illumina. You can, anyone can visualize it, and I'm sure a lot of you know it. Um, but we have these glass flow cells. Uh, I guess I don't have a pointer, but I'll try to make do. Um, and on these flow cells, they've hybridized uh, tiny fragments of, of DNA that are complementary to those adapters that get ligated on to, to your fragments of interest. Uh, and then through a process of, of clonal amplification and cluster generation, um, what you produce is a cluster of identical molecules, or millions of clusters of identical molecules uh, scattered across the surface of this flow cell. Uh, the chemistry that they, they use is, is one where uh, labeled, fluorescently labeled nucleotides are, are added to the reaction uh, simultaneously. A polymerase comes and incorporates them, copying the strand that's been hybridized to the, to the glass flow cell. Uh, and when that incorporation occurs, the fluorescence is released, uh, and they can uh, visualize literally with, with a camera that the color that is released for all of these individual clusters uh, on this flow cell. And this occurs, you know, millions of times at once, uh, and it, as I mentioned, uh, 200 times for our typical sequencing runs, and it takes about a week to do. So at the end of the day, you have your, your DNA fragment that has adapters at the end, and you'll sequence 100 bases from one end of it and 100 bases from the other end of it. And the nice part about this, which is you'll learn more about later in the week, is that we actually keep the information um, of this pair together as we do the analysis. So we know uh, where these 200 bases of DNA sequence are coming from uh, and that they're, they're, they're physically connected on the same molecule of DNA. So now there's many applications I mentioned. Um, 
you know, the, the simplest and probably the easiest to do uh, is whole genome sequencing, where we literally just take DNA, throw on some adapters, and throw it onto the machines. There's no processing required. Uh, and actually, it's the, it requires the least amount of DNA to do. It's kind of counterintuitive that to sequence more, you actually require less DNA. Um, then, you know, there's, there's various forms of targeted sequencing. Uh, people look at individual genes, um, entire exomes, the coding sequence. Uh, we can call different types of variation using this data, uh, and then we can also look at some look at other types of molecules, RNA, uh, proteomics. Uh, we can look at uh, epigenetic marks. We can look at DNA methylation, for example. We can look at transcription factor binding sites. Um, there's a really great poster. I, I wish we could. This wasn't so small, and we had a bigger copy of it. Uh, it's freely available from Illumina's website, and they've basically outlined all of the various applications as of, you know, I think they released this in February, uh, that are possible that you can do with current DNA sequencing technology. Um, so they, you know, I mean, yeah, uh, there, there's things on here that you know probably most of us have never heard about. People are doing really crazy things, uh, modifying flow cells, binding different things to it. Um, so anyways, I, I encourage you to go and, and get a copy of this poster. There's, there's one up, we've, if, I don't know if people are doing a, a walk around, but there's one up, uh, up on the sixth floor printed on the wall if you want to take a closer look at it. So when it comes to, I guess, at the very basic level of cancer genomics at the DNA level, um, you know, these are the types of, of variants that, that people are generally looking for. Um, so I, this cartoon is just supposed to illustrate, uh, you know, the the DNA sequencing reads um, as, as kind of the orange and blue bars being aligned to some sort of reference genome. Um, and so we, we look for differences between uh, the reference and our reads to identify you know, single nucleotide variations. Uh, we can look for uh, insertions or deletions in the reads in comparison to the reference. Um, we look for the abundance of reads in different regions, and this is the, the quantify ability, I guess if that's a word, uh, of sequencing technology where, you know, no reads at a particular region could indicate that you have a homozygous deletion. You know, half the amount of reads compared to a genome average can indicate a heterozygous deletion. Uh, double the amount of reads could indicate gains or copy number gain. Um, because of that paired end information that we have, we can look at one read lining to uh, one chromosome, another read aligning to another chromosome, which could indicate that there's a translocation there, some sort of structural rearrangement. Um, people are also looking at reads that don't align to humans, so you know, possible contamination or non-human sequence that's in your DNA. It could be pathogens, viruses, uh, bacteria, etc. Um, so obviously, they're, they're, these are this is kind of the simple level, and I think by the end of this week, you know, you'll go in great detail on you know the the, uh, the algorithms and the, the the tools and pipelines used to. To, to work with all of these types of variation. Um, now that's, the, I guess, the simplest form of sequencing, as I said, was, was doing it on the whole genome, but not everybody, you know, it, it's still fairly cost prohibitive to approach every project with whole genome sequencing. Uh, and so there's many methods people use to target specific regions of the genome. Uh, and really what it comes down to is the types of questions that you're asking or you're interested in uh, during your study. Um, and, and so the selection of the target enrichment method is going to depend on kind of, you know, how much material you have, how easy it is, how much expertise you have in manipulating nucleic acids, uh, how many samples you want, what kind of coverage you're looking for, what kind of biases you want to avoid, uh, you know, I guess the size of the target, the number of samples. You know, you want something that's fast, uh, like in a clinical setting where you can turn around really quickly and get data back in a timely manner, or are you more interested in more complete understanding of something? Uh, and so, you know, I guess probably one of the most common uh, applications would be looking at just the entire coding sequence of the genome. Uh, the, the methods are, are fairly straightforward. We still produce the DNA libraries as we would for whole genome shotgun sequencing, uh, but then those adapter, um, ad adapter pieces of DNA are, are selected for somehow. Um, people can use an array to capture them, although not as much anymore. Uh, people use probes in, in solution that have biotin uh, tags on them, and you can bind specific parts of the library and pull those out. Uh, and this is kind of the reason why it requires more DNA to do this, because you know, you're capturing about 1% of the genome. So you imagine if you only have, 
you know, a, a couple nanograms of DNA by capturing only 1% of it. Now you're talking about in the picograms of DNA. Uh, and so that's why targeted sequencing generally requires more than, than less. Um, you know, nonetheless, people still do a lot of the same analyses with exome data versus whole genome data. Uh, this just is showing, looking at copy number analysis, li literally counting the number of reads we see in uh, probably uh, 1,000 to, to 10,000 base pair windows. Uh, and you can see that major, major rearrangements, major gains and losses, like on chromosome 10, uh, you can identify even though you're only uh, selecting about 1% of the genome. Uh, but really, you're just losing the resolution that you would have if you had interrogated the entire genome. So that, that was for the last, uh, you, know, you know, about that five-year stretch. Um, and then about four years ago, um, the, people realized that they had kind of come to a, a plateau in, in the capabilities of the chemistry uh, in terms of how much data they can generate. And there's still slight advances, but really kind of the things have, have slowed down quite a bit. And, and, and now... The kind of mentality in DNA sequencing is that everyone can do it, and so um, people started producing, you know, smaller machines that are much more cost-effective, um, geared at towards other applications like a clinical market, for example. Um, so they aren't producing the same amount of data. Not, you don't require a giant compute cluster or a cloud to analyze all the data that comes off of it. Um, but but the the turnaround times are much faster, uh, and and so that kind of geared towards other applications. And so I, I won't go into too much detail, but I thought I'd highlight kind of the other players just because I think it's really important to understand where your data comes from and kind of depending on the, the technology that you use to generate your data, there, there's going to be different, um, you know, different biases, different error modes that, that are going to be associated with them. So the, the first one would be this, this ion torrent data from Life Technologies. Um, so, the you know the, the basis behind this is it's it's basically a miniaturized pH meter on the on these um, on these wafers where um, because of the natural process when DNA polymerase uh, incorporates another base into an extending molecule it releases hydrogen ions and so what they do is in these tiny little wells uh, on their wafers here um, they have a growing DNA strand being measured and, and they measure the changes in pH that are occurring uh, as these hydrogen ions are, are being released. And so there's no uh, modified nucleic acids required. It's literally just natural DNA polymerase uh, with natural nucleic acids um, being incorporated. The, the chemistry works a, a little bit uh, like this. So um, if you have a stretch of DNA that's being replicated, um, that they flow only a single nucleic acid at a time, so a T molecule developed by a G, an A, a C, uh, in a known pattern. And then for every base on the uh, template strand, um, it will incorporate as many bases that, that there are. So if you have a stretch of, of a single base, it will incorporate uh, many bases simultaneously. Uh, this is supposed to be illustrated if you had a, a sequence that was TGA, A, C, T, T, um, as you flow a T, you'd see a, a blip in the T signal. When it incorporated two Ts, the, the signal intensity would be twice as high. Three Ts, it would be three times as high. At least that's how it's supposed to work. Um, so that, I guess the, the biggest caveat with, with, with ion torrent data is there's a weakness um, for doing stretches of home polymer. So when you have a large stretch of the same base, once you get beyond, you know, two or three bases and you get three to five, you know, measuring that dis the, uh, the difference in s signal intensity of hydrogen ion release between three and four and four and six becomes a little more difficult. And there's a lot of work is done on algorithm development to clean up that data. But, you know, that's kind of the caveat going into if you're doing a project involved on torrent data is, is to know that you may think you found all these insertions, but really you're just seeing sequencing errors, as opposed to the aluminous sequencing error, which is a, a C to T substitution that probably occurs during, you know, ox oxidative damage during the library prep. Um, another uh, sequencer that kind of is, is like people call third generation DNA sequencing um, would be the Pacific Bioscience uh, RS system. Uh, and the idea behind this one is that you have a single polymerase uh, re uh, measure or replicating a single strand, a single molecule of DNA in one of these uh, ZMW waves or sorry, wells that they have on their chip. 
And so the nice thing about this is that there's no PCR amplification uh, and possible <laughs> biases due to amplification, that you're actually just measuring a molecule uh, in real time. They use labeled nucleotides that produce a signal that they can measure uh, as they're being incorporated in real time. Now, obviously, if you're measuring, you know, they have a camera or a microscope, essentially, that's looking at this well, uh, a single polymerase molecule, um, they're a little more error prone. The accuracy is probably only about 85%. But the nice thing about this is that because we don't have to amplify anything, um, they can sequence really long stretches of DNA. And so the, the average read length of a packed bio machine is probably somewhere around 10 KB right now. Uh, and so, you know, the, the applications, or the things you can discover when you have a, a 10 KB read uh, kind of opens a lot of doors of things that you're not going to be able to find uh, just by sequencing short 100 base pair by reads. And so that kind of opens the door. The, the throughput is it's much lower. Obviously, we're not producing you know, gigabases of data, um, more like tens of megabases. And then finally, I kind of brought this one up just because this is kind of the hottest thing going right now, um, would be nanopore technology. Um, and similar to PacBio, they're looking at a single molecule of DNA, uh, and they have th their membrane with these biological pores, that, um, and they can measure the electropotential changes across the membrane as molecules of DNA are, are basically eaten by these pores. Uh, and what they found is that uh, different sequence contexts produce different changes in electric, in, uh, in electric potential, and they are able to translate um, these blips in potential into, into DNA sequence or into small words of DNA sequence that they can then bring back together and um, kind of come up with the sequence that was being sequenced. Uh, I guess the, the downside is that, you know, the number of pores that you can fit on a, on a membrane and read simultaneously isn't very high. I think that the current version that they've released it has 500 pores. Um, but the nice thing is that, you know, really... Uh, there's no limit to the read length. So as long as you have a piece of DNA and that gets eaten by a pore, it'll just continue to go through. Um, you know, I think a lot of work, and still, you know, people don't really understand the error modes of making sure that the DNA only goes through the pore in one direction and doesn't end up stop or end up going in the other direction. But these are things that I think will come out in the coming months as more and more groups have these these machines and, and start using them. Yeah. Is anybody here in on the Nanayan data? Yeah. So we received our first one about a month ago. Um, we haven't actually sequenced anything of our own yet with it. There's a just ran their kits, ran their kits um, and now we've got some lambda DNA they want us to run through and upload to their their server to do the base calling. But yeah, hopefully pretty soon we're going to throw some cool stuff at it and just see what it looks like. Um, so I guess you know the take home from all of this is that we're really good at generating data, and I think why all of you are here is that. You know, what can we do with this data? How do we look at this data? Uh, and, you know, just kind of to give you a sense of the, the vast quantity of it, for those not familiar with it, um, when we look at, you know, just 1% of the genome, we're talking about thousands of variants in an individual genome where the position differs from the reference sequence. Um, with, you know, probably somewhere in 100 to 200 of these, you know, probably being considered to be deleterious to the gene function. If, you know, this kind of just grows exponentially as we look at more parts of the genome. Um, that, you know, in a, in a typical whole genome, we're going to see tens of thousands of variants that are, are different from the reference. And even if we're just talking about cancer and looking at somatic variants where, you know, not germline variation, in a typical whole genome, we see 1,000 to 5,000 uh, somatic mutations where, you know, probably around 50 of these are actually coding uh, predicted to alter uh, protein function. So you can imagine that if you're looking at hundreds or thousands of patients, uh, you're, you're talking about hundreds of thousands to millions of variants. And so really, I, I think a huge bottleneck is, is annotation interpretation of what we uncover. And I think you're spending a whole day just looking at um, ways to, to annotate w what's being uncovered. You know, probably the simplest would be coding variation because we have an idea uh, of of transcription and translation and how this can affect protein structure and there's there's many tools that look at you know comparative uh, genomics or structural analysis and how coding variation is predicted to alter function um, but then we have this entire you know you know all these other variants that don't occur within coding sequence that you know through projects like ENCODE and um, Transfec and such uh, are, are showed also be just as functional you know there's been predictions that uh, as much uh, as 90% of the genome or 
has has actual function in some regard. So I think that that's kind of where we're at, the state of the art right now, is that we're very good at generating data, but we're not so good at understanding all of the data that we generate. So quickly, I mentioned I'd talk about microarrays. Um, you know, most of you are probably not using microarrays or have never have and never will, but I thought because there's a session later on in the week, I, I would just throw this up quickly. Um, essentially, a microarray is a glass or, or film layer that, um, you know, just like a flow cell in sequencing, has molecules of nucleic acid bound to, to the surface that kind of stick up like little fingers. Uh, and then you can process your DNA, um, you can put adapters on it, and you can bind to the complementary little fingers on the microarray. Um, and, and with a incorporation of a fluorophore, and then measure the intensity uh, of the binding of your molecules to this microarray. Um, so, you know, the, the first, you know, the, the biggest, well, I guess, you know, the first type would just be using to detect single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. Uh, and the goal would be to, to find molecules that bind that are homozygous for an A allele, a heterozygous and homozygous for a B allele. But it was quickly shown that, you know, you could take the, the, the concert of all of these uh, probes that are on the microarray um, and similar that we do with whole genome sequencing, and, and look at the signal intensity uh, in, in windows across the genome. And it, what can be shown is that you can actually identify things like copy number variation pretty readily um, using these things designed to interrogate for, for SNPs. Um, I think what you're going to focus on mainly this week, though, is uh, gene expression arrays, where you know the, the same concept that we use, these, these DNA-bound Bind, are bound to, to a film or a glass slide um, is used to pull down uh, molecules of, of cRNA. So uh, total RNA is, is taken uh, and produced, in, or cDNA is produced from total RNA by reverse transcription. Um, it's then labeled, and, and then you kind of do this in vivo transcription uh, to reproduce what they call cRNA. Uh, and then the abundances of this cRNA can be measured based on the amount of it that binds to given probes for given genes in, in the genome. Uh, and I think Paul is going to go into much more detail on this. I just thought I'd mention it quickly. So that, given the, the technology that's available and, you know, you know early on, um, kind of with the, the, the development of this technology, people thought, saw that cancer was, was a field that could be uh, um, could benefit from this. And so you know, the, the idea of these cancer genome projects quickly took off uh, on the idea that one could take uh, a tumor sample and a, a normal sample from an individual and identify all of the genomic variants in that sample uh, and determine what was, uh, what was only in the tumor versus what was common to the tumor and the host. And the, the idea being that you know, something that's specific to the tumor must be causing uh, tumor genesis. Uh, and so the first example of this um, came out of WashU in 2009, I think, I believe, uh, where they took a single patient uh, with AML and they sequenced the entire genome of, of the, the tumor cells that they identified uh, and, the, and the, uh, the corresponding um, uh, normal blood cells from, from this patient. Uh, and lo and behold, there was a recurrent mutation in IDH1 that was later shown to be, you know, uh, contribute to tumor generis through the adduction of the H1 or HIF1 pathway. Uh, and, and so, you know, this, this was a great success of, of cancer genomics. We could take a tumor sample, we could sequence the entire genome, and lo and behold, we found, you know, a variant that's causing the disease. But, you know, you can imagine that in, in 2008, I guess, um, th this was a, a huge task just to, to look at a single genome. You know, where they had almost 4 million variants using those first generation of uh, DNA, uh, somatic variant or so DNA variant um, callers that they had to go through this process, which is really the process that we still use today. We kind of start with a, a list of variants and kind of slowly filter them down through kind of whatever filters we feel are, are most appropriate till we have basically a, um, a handful of variants that we feel, you know, we're, we're able to deal with. And that, that's kind of the field right now. Um, so, you, you know, taking these four million variants, they can uh, filter some of them out based on frequency, others based on the presence in publicly available databases. Um, then they only wanted to look at coding sequence because, frankly, they understood how to deal with coding variants. You know, we can make some sort of story about a variant in a coding sequence as opposed to uh, 
at the time, you know, the ENCODE data wasn't released, so non-coding variants were just appeared to be garbage. Um, we could look at the types of variants, synonymous versus non-synonymous. Uh, they can try to validate as many using other methods, PCR, um, Sanger-based sequencing. Some of those they just couldn't do the technical reasons. It turned out about 150 of them were not real. And in the end, they actually had a, you know, probably eight validated somatic SNV coding non-synonymous SNVs. Uh, and one of them happened to be in a gene that was interesting. So that, you know, they, that's kind of the, the state, you know, uh, a few years ago of, of how this and, you know, sequencing one tumor got you a New England Journal paper. Uh, and that kind of continued for the next couple of years. Here's just some of the early studies where people looked at um, breast cancers, other blood tumors, uh, melanoma, and sequenced either entire genomes or just looked at exomes in very kind of a modest size cohorts in most cases. Uh, and identified recurrent mutations, um, found things we already knew, uh, and that was that was kind of the the the, the, the way things were went until about probably two years ago or so. And so we did learn, you know, quite a bit, and you know, groups have cataloged all this information. Sorry if this is difficult to see, but this is just trying to show you that um, these are different tumor types listed along the bottom, and they're kind of color coded based on. Um, the number of, of coding somatic variants that are identified uh, in, the, in those whole genomes. And so you have on the left, um, th this would be uh, colorectal cancer that's, micro that's microsatellite instable, so that, you know, these, these, <coughs> these, um, these tumors that have this mutator phenotype where they just have, you know, th hundreds to thousands of somatic variants is kind of off the chart. Uh, then moving to the right, uh, in the light pink here, you have the kind of carcinogen um, induced um, mutations. So we have uh, smoking-induced lung cancers, UV-induced melanomas, where there's you know that there's actually some sort of um, force-driving mutations there. Um, then you kind of have the, the the common to most tumor types kind of have this average 50 to 100 mutations. So you know these are probably associated with just getting older, um, the age-associated mutations, and so on. And then finally, on the far right, you have the pediatric tumor types. Uh, that tend to have fewer somatic mutations, mostly because they just, you know, these are probably have some sort of germline um, predisposition to developing a tumor and don't require the same burden or mutational load to actually develop uh, the cancer. So the other thing um, that people started identifying was, was looking at, you know, oncogenes versus tumor suppressors. And really what, what came up was that the, the, the pattern of somatic mutations within a gene can really help you determine what, what the, if that gene is, is functional and, um, or is playing a role in the tumor. And so what you see is that from, for things like an oncogene, what you generally have is mutations fall uh, in specific hotspots or in specific regions. And so if you start to look at the pileup of missense mutations in, in quote-unquote known you know, oncogenes, they tend to only fall in, in certain locations. Um, whereas as tumor suppressors uh, tend to have mutations spanning the entire coding sequence and are, are more likely to be truncating mutations that, than just missense mutations. And now this just makes sense if you just think about the biology. If you want uh, a gene that's going to be activating or driving a tumor, it's probably going to be a, a missense mutation somewhere in the coding sequence, probably at a particular location, altering DNA binding or, or um, um, some sort of receptor binding that's just going to constitutionally turn it on. Whereas a, a tumor suppressor, something that's going to, uh, you know, something that, that completely removes the function of the gene is more likely to, to cause the tumor. And so, you know, um, you know famously, Vogelstein has come up with the, this 2020 rule where if we just kind of look across tumors and if we say that uh, to be called an oncogene, we want to see that more than 20% of mutations in gene are recurrent at a particular uh, spot in our missense. Uh, versus tumor suppressors where if we want to see more than 20% of mutations are, are anywhere in a gene are activating. So they can use this and we can look at all of the sequences that's been done. And if we look at over 3,000 tumors that have been kind of pub where the data has been publicly made available, um, you know, there, this is about 300,000 coding variants, but only 125 genes are predicted using this rule to actually be driving cancer. Um, 71 tumor suppressors, 54 oncogenes. Um, now I guess kind of the the downside to this, or kind of the, the part that's not so exciting, is that you know only 30% of these were novel. You know, most of this had already been identified through traditional molecular biology, um, through through epidemiology, and and so on. And so, th th this is not you know 
as much hype was given to you know next gen sequencing and being able to sequence genomes and kind of uncovering everything, really we're we're only getting a third more information than what was already known using um, older techniques. But uh, nonetheless, we've prevailed and we're, we're continuing on. Uh, and so now, kind of, I think that the the search for for new new driver genes has kind of been exhausted. But you know, I'm sure there'll be a rare tumor type here or there where a new gene will be uncovered. Um, but for the most part, for common tumor types, I, I think we know the main players. And so now it's starting to, to investigate other questions, um, such as kind of tumor heterogeneity and tumor evolution. Um, so this is another uh, paper that came out of uh, that same group that sequenced the first uh, AML tumor. Um, what they did is they actually were able to identify cells kind of that were pre-neoplastic um, uh, and, and well as normal can, uh, germline cells from that same individual and then finally tumor cells. And they can look at the patterns of somatic variation and then kind of plot these uh, over time and show that, you know, uh, as the tumor progresses from this preneoplastic to, to tumor, um, it's acquiring more mutations. Um, the, the, the color indicates, you know, a particular clone of the cell and you can see that um, at the myelodysplastic syndrome stage that there was 50% of the tumor, um, you know, was in one was in one clone, uh, and then there was two other clones. One, you know, would probably appeared to be normal in about a quarter of the cells, uh, and another quarter of the cells had a, a different mutational profile. But you can see that as it progressed, um, it seemed to be this clone that acquired additional mutations uh, that led to the full blown uh, uh, cancer in this case. But then even at, at the, the stage of tumor. They identified you know, probably five different um, molecularly distinct clones of, of tumor based on the, the somatic variants that they identified. So what was really interesting was that they, they've carried on and, and started to look at kind of the tracking the, the clonal evolution of these tumors through, right through treatment and, and into relapse. And so you kind of see the same graph where you have um, kind of initial mutations in this uh, that are kind of characteristic of, of AML, the DMT3, AMPN1, FIT3, et cetera. Um, but as different clones acquired more mutations at a different frequency um, in the full-blown disease, kind of during therapy, though, um, most of these of clones were reduced and eradicated. You know, the drugs work. They do kill off what they're intended to. Unfortunately, though, um, in this case, there, there was a particular clone that, that stayed alive um, that wasn't fully eradicated by the disease, and then kind of over time acquired additional mutations and then relapse occurred as, as it continued to expand and, and grow out. And so that's, I think, one of the powers of being able to interrogate um, these tumors really deeply and generating so much data is that we can, you know, kind of look at questions like this um, that was not possible previously without doing some complicated, you know, biology. So kind of the take home is that, you know, cancer is a disease of the genome. It's Kind of the model is that um, normal germline cells will progressively acquire somatic mutations. Um, some of those mutations will, will be passenger mutations that don't really have any consequence on the fate. Others will provide a selective advantage to those cells that will, um, as it acquires additional mutations, will, will drive the, the growth and, uh, of those cells until you're in kind of a, a full-blown um, tumor state. And so the, the real challenge is identifying kind of that, I guess it was the expression, the wheat from the shaft, where you, you want to identify what, what are those variants that are, that are providing the advantage to those cells when you have this, this heterogeneous mixture of cells, some that are going to have many more variants than others, but uh, may not be actually providing an advantage to the cell. And so, you know, heterogeneity, uh, I've heard described as, I mean, really this just means chaos, and that's kind of the, where we are in cancer genomics right now, is, is studying chaos. So, there, this comes in four different forms, both kind of within the cell, within the tumor itself, you can have multiple subclones, um, all with different patterns of mutations, um, some of them giving rise or making uh, more aggressive than others, um, but, but, but probably having some sort of common ancestor at, at some point. Um, you can have, you know, diff variation between kind of a primary tumor and its different meta um, metastases. So as as chunks of tumor fall off and enter circulation and then up implanting other places in, in the body. Um, you might have some cells that are preferentially will end up in a liver, others may in the lung, um, some that may never be able to, to metastasize. You have kind of 
between the metastases themselves, they can continue to evolve and acquire more mutations. Um, they may even end up branching off and seeding back to the primary tumor. So, you, you know, you can have this kind of anything is possible in cancer genomics as far as, um, you know, the, the acquiring of mutations, the, the growth advantage that these mutations infer, and then kind of the, where they, these cells end up in the body. And then finally, you know, even between patients with the same tumor type, there can be a, a tremendous amount of variability um, looking at the, the, the landscape of mutations that are present. And so that's kind of the, the challenges that studying chaos kind of gives us. So another major challenge is sensitivity. And so um, as most of you are probably aware, you know, tumors are not 100% tumor cells. And so when you look at, you know, when pathologists look and identify uh, tumor cells under the microscope, that there's also, you know, other cell types, both normal cells, lymphocytes, lymphoblasts, et cetera, that are, um, uh, that are present in that when we take a piece of tissue and then extract DNA and sequencing it, we're extracting uh, DNA from all of these cells. And so you can imagine that, um, you know, looking for a, a variant in a cell population that is only made up of 50% tumor, you know, is, is going to be... Um, you know, the variant frequency that we're going to see is going to be half as if we were sequencing 100% tumor. You know, finally, you have, uh, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of evidence of, um, of kind of ploidy issues or, you know, the number of genome copies present in tumor cells can be quite dramatically different from, from normal cells. And so, you know, the, the combinations of having four copies of the genome uh, in 20% of the cells versus four copies in 80% and 20% normal cells, you can see that the, 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 the spectrum of somatic mutations can be quite different just depending on where from that tumor you're, you're sampling. Um, another downside to dealing with tumor tissues um, can be the accessibility of the material. Um, you know, we often deal with biopsies or fine needle aspirates uh, of tumor tissue, and, and really we're kind of taking a shot in the dark that we're that we're going to collect tumor tissue and, and enough of it to interrogate. Um, these are actual slides from a study we did where we bi biopsied a number of people, and you can see that the amount of tumor that's been highlighted in red can vary quite dramatically um, from biopsy to biopsy. And so this is going to impact on your ability to do different types of analyses as far as how much material you're going to get and, you know, what kind of, what, what proportion of the tumor you're actually interrogating in the sample. Um, another huge re resource is, is formalin fixed paraffin embedded material. So, you know, pretty much it's standard clinical practice now for, for when tumors are resected or biopsied that they're, they're for, um, you know, for, for diagnostics, they're, they're embedded, uh, they're fixated, embedded. Um, these, the nice thing is that these blocks kind of are, st are storable at room temperature. You know, there, there's warehouses in, of, around the world of, you know, millions of these blocks from like, dating back to probably well, many decades. Um, and the, the nucleic acids and the morphology is, is preserved in these, and that's the reason they do it, is so that under a microscope, a pathologist can look at this and say, yes, this is a tumor material. Um, and so to try and take advantage of this, this vast resource without trying to sample things prospectively, you know, a lot of work has been done on trying to go back and get, you know, um, material from these samples. And obviously the, the fixation process and so on is going to affect that. Yeah? But the problem with those is usually they're not consented. And that, I mean, I think that depends on your jurisdiction. Um, so in the U.S., for example, once a patient is deceased, their, their samples are open for whatever you want. You can do whatever you want with them. In Canada, the, the rules are a little different. Um, so yeah, that, that's a huge caveat. Um, we've had to gone, gone back to, to families of deceased patients and asked for permission to use their, their blocks um, before they're destroyed. So yeah, that's, that's a huge issue. And I think, um, you know, I think moving forward, a lot of the large academic sites, at least, are, are consenting people, all patients, for um, that their material can be used for research purposes down the line. Um, it may not be for a specific project. Um, they may not say exactly what's going to be done, but they're just being consented and banked. And that's why we have these giant biobank initiatives right now um, all over North America and Europe and the world, for that matter. Um, yeah, so we're still trying to understand kind of what happens to, to nucleic acid when it's fixated and, and, you know, what kind of damage occurs and what kind of variants are introduced. Um, and so I, I think I just wanted to illustrate in this cartoon, um, you know, if, if the red and blue lines are supposed to indicate, you know, 
paired in sequencing reads forward and reverse, uh, and the little colored um, dots are, are, are variants in these reads compared to aligning them to a reference genome. Um, what we have to do is try to look at kind of the frequency of these variants. Uh, the, are the, the variants only occurring on one forward read or reverse read? And try to um, tease apart what's real, what's an artifact. Um, and you know, often people use things like the quality of the alignment of the reads um, to, to filter variants or the frequency of the read. Um, you know, some, sometimes you have things where reads are, are, are misaligning and you get you know, patterns where you have a couple variants really close together in one read that are probably more likely an alignment area and that those reads don't actually belong in that part of the reference. Um, we see lots of biases that a read is only coming from one particular, or a variant is only called when we see it in one strand, and the strand, strand bias error. Um, we get artifacts from the, the amplification process and that, you know, when dealing with the, these uh, tumors that have low tumor content, um, you know, we'll often see some variants that are at 50, 60 percent and others that are at 10, 20 percent. Um, and is this uh, just a, a fact that we have sequenced um, only 20 percent tumor material or are these just some sort of artifact that, that's come up? And so that's a lot of the issues and I'm sure things are going to be touched on throughout the week on, on dealing with um, quality control of the data and calling variants, et cetera. I just kind of I threw this in there because this is kind of a personal interest to me and something that I work on is is methods that are used um, kind of up front before the sequencing takes place to, to remove some of these errors and, and artifacts. And so, um, you know, the, the, this method of, of ISOSeq was first described uh, in this PNAS paper a couple years ago, where they incorporate random barcodes into the sequencing adapters before they get ligated on and, and subsequently clonally amplified. And so what what happens then is that every um, every read has a unique barcode associated with it. And so if all of your variants are only ever seen uh, associated with one barcode, you can be pretty sure that that's just an amplification error and that you, you really want to see variants across the spectrum of barcodes uh, to make the, to, to, to feel more strongly that they're, they're real. Um, you know, another thing a lot of groups are working on are ways to enrich for tumor material so that it, it reduces that problem and then we can look for variants at 50%. Um, so from formalin fixed or fresh frozen material, you can actually look at them under a microscope and, and cut out regions using a laser uh, of tumor cells um, and, and remove, try to remove some of that background normal tissue. Um, you know, it's quite, you can imagine it's quite time intensive to, to sit down and look at slides under a microscope, identify regions of tumor, kind of draw them, circle, circle them on the computer screen and have the laser cut them out and, you know, depending on kind of the, the cellularity of the tumor, it may take several slices uh, of tumor to get enough material out to, so that you can do things with it. Um, other groups, and, and something that I'm a little familiar with, is, is taking fresh material, dissociating these tumors, and actually doing flow cytometry to sort out the, uh, different cells. Um, now this will rely on things like cell surface uh, risk markers that can be fluores uh, tagged with antibodies that are fluorescently labeled, and you can differentiate your tumor into different components uh, and get generate cells that uh, of different types that then you can interrogate separately. But how often do you get fresh sample versus that are from a I mean, it depends. I mean, we have a, we have a project ongoing right now that we are working with a, a surgery group that is, um, you know, the samples are coming right out of the OR. Half of them go to pathology for diagnosis, and the other half comes to us that day, and they're shipped. Uh, um, in media, and we dissociate them that day. So, you know, I, I think kind of as, as new research projects are, are, are starting to, to realize the benefits of, of dealing with fresh versus uh, archival material, you know, protocols like that are going to be incorporated. But yeah, obviously, it's, you know, we're not talking about hundreds of samples, we're talking one a week, maybe. Yeah. Um, no, that's a really good question. Um, so the question was kind of what's the specificity of, of when you're using um, kind of markers of, of tumor that are, you know, you're using surrogate markers for tumor. And so, you know, generally for, for epithelial tumors, we'll use epithelial markers um, like EPCAM to differentiate tumor between normal. But there's nothing to guarantee that you're not pulling out just normal epithelium or, or that all of your tumor hasn't 
you know, undergone EMT and no longer has those cell surface receptors. Um, and so that's why, I mean, I think in our experience, we keep everything. Um, but we and, and sequence all of the fractions separately and try to look for, you know, are there variants we're seeing in another fraction that are similar to what we're also seeing in tumor? Um, yeah, but that, that's, I know another other groups um, uh, uh, sort based on ploidy. So you can take um, just nuclei and sort them based on the, the DNA content of the nuclei. And so uh, if you're assuming that most of your tumor has undergone major kind of chromosomal loss or gain, that they'll have more or less nucleic acid than normal cells that will just have two copies of DNA. But again, that's you, you can't guarantee that you don't have tumors that are closer to that as well. So I think you know these methods are are working, and there's there's a lot of literature on it, but there's they're not by by no means 100 percent. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, the, the freezing process is going to remove a lot of the, the, the cell surface um, receptors. And so um, it, it's those samples that you'd have to come up with other methods like looking at, um, you know, that there's new methods on sorting based on intracellular markers. They're a little more novel. You kind of um, bathe the cells in, um, in the, these fluorophores that are taken up, and you can kind of try to do that. Um, but I think more common is where you just extract nuclei from the cells that are still intact and sort based on things like ploidy. Uh, I'm trying to come up with, uh, yeah, you'll get kind of batches of, um, you know, cells at 2N, at 4N, at in between. Um, so it's a way of, of sampling different populations of cells, you know, with no guarantee that your 4N is all tumor or that your 2N is all normal. Um, I, I think we found that it varies by pathologist. Um, that some, uh, you know, we did that. We actually did a blinded study of comparing um, the pathologist estimate of tumor content versus what we see based on just variant frequency in the sequencing data. And and some perform really well, and some not so well. Um, you know, the 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 work we did in pancreas cancer, we won't sequence anything that a pathologist says is lower than 20% without doing some sort of enrichment method. Um, and that's just kind of what we've done. You know, sometimes they say it's lower than 20%. We sequence it, and it turns out it's higher than that. Um, but for the most part, when they say lower than 20%, it's usually very low. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the laser capture method, you know, is a way of doing it, but it, it is quite, you know, you need a, an expert, someone who has a histology background that can sit in front of a microscope and, um, take a slide that's been marked up by a pathologist and then go and look at other slides from that same sample and try to identify the same regions. And, you know, tumors are not, you know, every slide is not the same. Um, you know, ductal structures may differ and so on. So as you move throughout a tumor, the regions you're capturing are not going to be the same. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, for it depends on on what you want to do. Um, so our for our fresh samples, yeah, they go straight into OCT. They get shipped here right away, and they get dissociated the same day. Uh, and then they we um, viably freeze the dissociated cells, uh, and that way that that preserves the the kind of the cell surface structure of them, so that we can use a sorting method later. Um, for fresh frozen samples, I mean they they don't they can be frozen right away. Uh, or for paraffin embedded samples, for example, and then you know, slides can be agent slides can be generated, and, and you know the, the laser capture can be done on them. And also the fresh frozen tissue or OCT tissue is only mainly used for discovery research. I mean, if you have to translate something, you need to show that it's viable in the FFP setting. Otherwise, um, well, I mean, I, I think it depends on kind of the 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 way you think that things will be used clinically. Um, you know, obviously, kind of standard of care, all samples are going to go into to, to FFPE. Um, and so if you want to come up with a, a, a diagnostic marker or a prognostic marker, it'd be simpler to incorporate it into a kind of the standard of care right now. Um, that might not be possible because your marker may alter or something. And so, you know, you may require a fresh biopsy from a patient that doesn't go into to formalin to do something. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, I think most uh, most of the biomarker work that's done now, they they do some discovery and then try to make sure they validate it in FFE samples so that it it'd be easier to incorporate into standard of care. Um, the, the quality is very high, at least we found so far, the, the abundance, the, the, just the number of cells you get from each fraction can be quite low. Um, and so it, it can be quite difficult, you know, to, uh, you know, obviously some sort of amplification is needed and the biases in RNA amplification can be quite dramatic. And so, you know, we tend not to trust the as much. I, th I think we, we, we need, I, I mean, it's too early to say, really, but we get really high quality RNA. It's, we don't get a lot of it. So from laser capture, you... Uh, laser capture, we haven't done as much RNA work, so I, I don't know if I can comment quite, but it, it, abundance would be the same. We don't, we're not getting millions of cells. It's more like thousands. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I, I don't know, I'm sure. I mean, they're not going active transcription, so it would probably be more degradation than anything else. Yeah. So it's slightly off the topic, but I wanted to know, will the group, like, mixture of population, like tumor cell versus normal cell, will it help in identifying the SNPs based on population? Because there is a lot of variation in population. But I don't know how much data is out there to identify that this is the normal uh, SNP in a population. So will it help that? Yeah, I mean, I think most most tumor projects um, try to sequence a corresponding normal sample from an individual to try and identify tumor versus normal. Um, and so you can imagine if you have different populations from even within a tumor, you can start doing these kind of pairwise or, or multivariate kind of comparisons where, you know, you have this fraction versus normal and this fraction versus this other tumor fraction and try to kind of tease apart kind of what's going on within both the tumor and within the individual. Yeah, sometimes it's not possible there are not normal, normal tumor samples. Normal samples are not available. Yeah, it's true. And I think um, I'm just doing the, I'm sure, um, I, I believe um, Sarab's going to talk about calling somatic variation and um, some of the work people are doing when you don't have a normal and, and how you can try to filter out based on publicly available databases or, or other algorithms. I know there's a lot of work going on that right now. Anything else about... Um, how are we doing on time? Oh, okay. Um, so uh, I guess you know, moving forward, um, given the challenges of, of of cancer genomics and you know the, the development of technology, you know these large consortium of efforts, both international, with the ICGC project, uh, and through the TCGA, the largely American-based effort, have gone on to characterize the somatic landscape. Uh, across many different tumor types. Um, you know, and the rationale is pretty straightforward. It's, this is a huge problem, um, and so it's better to coordinate resources what, rather than having everybody uh, reproduce the same work. Um, we, if we produce data under kind of standardized, uniformed um, metrics, it makes things that like merging data sets much easier um, to increase power and, and so forth. Um, and then, you know, getting many more groups around the world, this, this kind of spreads both um, the, the knowledge more readily and, and accelerates kind of the dissemination of information, um, having groups from around the world, from different countries, from different um, regions participating simultaneously. But you can imagine this is a massive effort that, you know, just looking at 50 tumor types, um, where if you have 500 cases and 500 controls, that's 50,000 human genome projects. So like, this, the scale is quite enormous. Um, this map is a little dated because there's a couple projects that are missing from it, but you know, this is just the ICGC map of projects that are currently ongoing. Um, they actually, the meeting just took place last week in, in Beijing where groups from all of these groups met and to kind of talk about their data, um, to share kind of progresses and, and so forth. And you can see that you know, there's many different tumor types, at least 39 um, in around 13 countries. And so far 18,000 tumors have been part of this effort. Um, you can go to the website icgc.org for more information on specific projects, um, specific tumor types. Uh, and all of the data is publicly available, or the somatic data is publicly available um, 
germline data requires um, authorized access to, but uh, it's all available through the, the ICGC data portal. And you can see that um, just a week ago, was a release, uh, the 16th release of data was made where, if you can read that, there's 49 tumor types uh, have had data made available. Um, this includes both DNA sequencing data, RNA sequencing data, expression. Oh, okay, so Francis is going to go over that. Um, there's other resources I'm sure he'll talk about too. This one is out of Sloan Kettering, where they've, you know, compiled all of this data together, make it freely available, which is um, great for people that want to look at it. And so what this has really led to is, is, is groups have started to look at, you know, all of this different t data, but in two ways. We can look at combining data, kind of multiple types of data for a given tumor type. Um, which I'll, I'll touch on a little bit, but they can also look at you know individual type of data across many different tumor types, and so these are these pan cancer uh, analysis projects going on. Um, so the, the the first one um, was outlined led by the TCGA in 2000, where they mostly had exome data on thir or 12 different tumor types, uh, as well as other copy number, uh, clinical data, uh, expression, and so forth. Um, and there's a current ongoing one. Um, led primarily by the ICGC, we're looking at whole genome data on thousands of tumor types. Uh, and so kind of the, some of the interesting things that start to come out of this when you start to look at, um, you know, data across multiple tumor types is, is something that came out of um, uh, the Sanger, of, uh, I guess later last year, um, where they, they looked at the trinucleotide sequence context uh, of somatic variants across all of these tumors. So um, they took out the... For every given variant, um, kind of listed as, as the, the six variants across the top, they looked at one base upstream and one base downstream. So you have 96 possible trinucleotide context for every given variant type. And they just counted those and normalized them across different tumor types. Um, and then when you have this kind of matrix of 96 by thousands, you then use... Um, kind of non-negative matrix factorization to try and identify patterns within these. And so what they quickly identified was, I mean, they came up with 21 patterns of somatic variants in, in the 3,000 or so tumors that they looked at, and they could relate these patterns to different exposures, as they, they call them. And so if you look at kind of their, their signatures or patterns, um, the, the first one, or signature 1A and 1B, are associated with, with, with age-related cancer, so um, the, or age of onset of the disease. So these mutations are probably kind of the, this is probably your typical cancer, progressively acquiring mutations over time uh, until, you know, a, a driver mutation is eventually happens and, and gives rise to the disease. But you can see that there's other patterns um, corresponding to other exposures, uh, smoking and lung cancer, uh, UV melanomas, um, these DNA mismatch repair pathways, these kind of mutator phenotypes, um, people that have um, BRCA1 and 2 um, germline mutations tend to have kind of this, this flat pattern and there's a, a lot of indels and so on. But, but despite that, you know, half of these, so they have no idea what's causing it. You know, and maybe it's just a purely, it's a mathematical um, thing that they can identify a pattern that, that's not real, but, you know, given that about half of them do have actual exposures, it, it begs the question, well, what, what's causing these other, these other types? And then that's kind of the first big thing that came out of it was pretty straightforward, combining all of these somatic um, SNV data from many tumor types. Um, other groups, um, this is actually another group at the Sanger, started comparing both copy number and structural variant data um, from a single tumor type, uh, for example. Uh, and what they noticed is that um, the copy number is, is shown as these black dots between, um, you know, one and three here. Uh, and this is, this is actually from... Um, array, SNP array data, but uh, when they combine the, the breakpoints of, of the copy number data, they see that there's actually um, evidence for structural rearrangements um, and, and uh, kind of head-to-tail and tail-to-tail -tail inversions at these same breakpoints. And what they then do is they, they go on and show kind of um, using simulation studies that in order for this pattern of, of structural rearrangements to occur, it's impossible or it's statistically significantly unlikely to have this pattern of, of copy number um, where, where you really only see kind of this two-step jumping uh, 
as you move along the chromosome that, you know, if this was to happen in like a, a sequential manner of, you know, a genome doubling event followed by an inversion followed by some sort of um, deletion and so on, you, the, the variation in copy number would be actually quite more extensive. And so, you know, what they've proposed is this kind of catastrophic model of, of chromosome shattering where at a single point in time, um, some sort of event causes the chromosome to, to break apart uh, and then kind of using the cell's natural methods of, of, of repair, um, you get this kind of non-homologous end joining of, of these fragments kind of just, you know, willy-nilly across the genome. You know, some regions will become lost, others may become amplified, um, and, you know, provided that the, the, the necessary components of the chromosome are still there. They probably have to still be some sort of centromeric region that this will continue to propagate and, and could actually provide a selective advantage to the cell. So it kind of begs the question that, you know, maybe the, the, the model of um, where you kind of, you know, a, a mutation rate is fixed in a given cell type and kind of over time as you progressively acquire more, more mutations um, until you finally hit the mutation that gives rise to full-blown cancer may not always be the case that perhaps you could have kind of this progressive acquiring of mutations over time but then maybe in some cases you have this catastrophic event that might be the final kind of blow that drives that cell over the edge and so it's something that you know the punctuated evolution is, is the term that, that we use now to describe this where um, you might have this progressive evolution of the tumor until at one point in time you just all of a sudden explode yeah Um, well, uh, so the, the question was, how do you find if this is kind of the major driving force behind a tumor? And, uh, you know, I think that's, that's kind of the, the work that, that is needed still is to kind of functionally validate that this is what's causing it. Um, so, you know, you definitely don't see this in all tumor types. And even within a tumor type, you don't see it in every, every sample. Um, you know, that, that you can validate that this has happened. You can use FISH and, and Sky to actually look at the chromosome structure and see that, Yes, you do have these chromosomes that have been put back together, um, but to, to, to functionally demonstrate that that is, is the way, I, I think, is still kind of remains to be seen. Um, you know, this is a, the, there's a, when, when people used to do like radiation hybrid maps of genomes, kind of pre-sequencing, this is kind of one of the things they did was they would, um, you know, they had a, a chromosome of interest and they would apply radiation to shatter it to see what necessary components have to be present in the cell for that cell to continue to live. And so they, um, you could imagine, you know, developing models where you would kind of artificially introduce this and to see if that's going to derive tumor genesis in some sort of animal or in vitro, in vivo or, in vitro or animal model. Um, but I think right now it's kind of a purely speculative Well, I mean, we can identify the, the chromothripsis from high-throughput sequencing data, but to actually, you know, say that this is what's causing a given tumor is, is kind of requires some further work. Oh, I mean, this is, I mean, so we, we look for, you know, it, it, it's quite straightforward. You look at the, you could just combine the, the copy number data and the structural data. Um, so you're, you're going to talk about later in the week, you know, calling copy number variation, calling segments of copy number, um, you know, uh, calling structural rearrangements and so on. And then it, it's, uh, so actually in this paper um, that they published, they actually come up with a, um, a number of breakpoints versus number of copy number states metric. And they look for that across the different chromosomes. And if it's above a certain threshold, I forget what the number is, they, they call that a candidate for chromothripsis or chromoplexy or, you know, major catastrophic event. And then you can then, you know, it involves then almost like the manual curation of it. I mean, there's still a lot of that involved looking to see that, oh, yes, we do see this kind of distinctive two-state copy number pattern with these massive rearrangements associated with it. And that's kind of the state of how you develop it. And then, of course, you could then, if you have material left, you could go and validate it using um, FISH or other cytogenetic methods to confirm that it is the case. All right, how are we doing on time? So, um, you know, another interesting aspect is, is talking about the kind of the heterogeneity uh, of tumors and, you know, what, what groups have done now is, 
is, is taking multiple samples from the same tumor. Uh, in this case, this is a renal carcinoma that this group um, uh, cut into six different pieces uh, and you're able to, to take cells from each of those six pieces and, and profile them with next-gen sequencing. And what they found was distinct copy number profiles, even within individual cells, from the, the different geographical locations of the same tumor. Uh, and from these profiles, you can then you know, do some hierarchical, hierarchical clustering to, to show the, the cells that are related to each other and those that are more diverse and come up with kind of a, an evolution uh, of tumor progression um, within a sample. Um, this is, in this case, this I mentioned earlier, so they float sorted these, the cells um, based on ploidy, and you can see that um, you have some populations of cells where you have a small fraction kind of at different ploidies, others where you have fractions that are a much higher ploidy, uh, and so on. And then, you know, with the, the advances in the technology, we can take a single cell uh, and take, extract the DNA and, and sequence that single cell um, to identify a copy number. The single base resolution from single cell is probably still a little ways off, but definitely looking at um, bins of read count across you know, large regions of a, of a genome is quite possible from, from even a single cell. And so if we can do this from tumor individual cells, you know, the idea is that, well, you know, tumors are constantly shedding material into the bloodstream, um, so we could probably capture that material and interrogate that as well. Uh, and so both in, you know, lots of, of work is being done on methods for capturing circulating tumor cells that are, 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 are flowing that can then be um, sequenced or analyzed some way. Um, but also, you know, sometimes when, when tumors uh, are rupturing, you know, they, they shed just tumor DNA. And so, you know, just by isolating DNA from, from patients, um, you can then, um, you know, perform analyses or sequence just kind of the bulk DNA sample you get out of someone's uh, um, serum and then and, and identify somatic variations. And so there's obviously a lot of applications that, that people have, have thought about with this, you know, using this as early detection methods, um, you know, if perhaps even before a, a tumor is, is, is visible on MRI, for example, it might be shedding material that could be screened for circulating um, or, you know, to track... Uh, um, resistance or, or progression, um, you know, minimal residual disease and leukemias, for example, could possibly be tracked using by isolating this material from, from circulating system. So that kind of brings us to kind of the clinical applications uh, of cancer genomics. Um, and I guess you kind of have to start by thinking with the kind of the current treatment paradigm, um, which, it, which is mostly, for the most part, based on kind of uh, kind of physical location of a tumor type and then followed by histopathology. Um, there are several molecular tests that are part of standard of care right now um, and are conducted in, in the clinical um, molecular labs. Um, but for the most part, these are, are you know, single, single variant analyses like a, a BRAF mutations in melanoma uh, or KRAS in colorectal or, or looking at known driver fusion genes in, in leukemias, for example. And so you know, that, that's kind of the state, and, and the goal, I think, with all of the work and the reason we're here is to eventually incorporate all of this data that we're generating um, to try and change some of the standard of care and incorporate, you know, genomics in, into routine practice. And so, you know, we get these N of 1 studies that are published from time to time um, of, of that kind of keep fueling the justification of why we're hearing, uh, of why we're doing this. Um, so this example um, of an extreme outlier on the Everlimus clinical trial that had this, you know, profound response and a, a two-year follow-up of two years of progression-free survival. And so they sequenced the genome of that patient, given that um, the majority of patients on that trial did not have that response. And, you know, they identified a variant in, in, in TSC1. You know, they applied their filtering magic to get down from the tens of thousands of variants that they identified to one in a gene that was interesting. And then if you go back and look at that gene and other patients on the trial, you sure enough other patients that had, you know, milder responses also had variants in that TSC pathway compared to those that had wild type for the gene ha had the worst events. So, you know, definitely there, there's a role of, of this um, drug response that is definitely, in, that is definitively influenced by the, the tumor uh, genome. So the other thing that comes up is that as we look at, you know, the, the prevalence of somatic mutations across many different tumor types, um, we see that, well, you know, there are certain mutations that are more common in particular cancers, 
Um, you know, BRAF V600E melanoma, for example, is very common. But we also see those same variants across other tumor types. And so the idea could be, well, why, why are we diagnosing tumors based on, you know, kind of their histology or where they're located when we could just try to come up with a molecular characterization of the tumor um, instead? Now, the, the caveat being is that, um, like, you know, BRAF colorectal cancers do not respond to BRAF inhibitors like BRAF melanomas do. But, you know, the idea is that maybe other drugs or other targeted agents might have the same effect. Um, and, you know, with this current um, kind of drug development cycle, there, there's a number of new agents and developing agents that are targeted for specific um, uh, kind of somatic alterations, you know, both at the mutation level, like I mentioned, a lot of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors are targeted specifically to particular um, driver mutations or carriers of particular driver mutations. Um, but there's a lot of these um, antibodies for people that contain um, different translocations, um, amplifications, et cetera. And so the idea is that if we can profile the, the, the genomes of these tumors, you know, and more and more drugs come available, there'll be more and more um, opportunity to, to treat based on the molecular profile rather than the just simply on the histology. And so this is an example of kind of a, a clinical workflow. This was a project that we undertook here where, you know, we're we not a clinical diagnostic lab. We are a research sequencing center, but we wanted to, to pair up with the clinical lab and perform DNA sequencing uh, in such a way where a patient could come into a hospital. They would undergo some sort of biopsy. Uh, it would be reviewed by a pathologist to confirm the diagnosis. And then that sample um, would be transferred to the diagnostic lab where, as part of standard of care, um, uh, blood and tumor DNA were extracted. Um, some, you know, genotyping was done in their lab, but we received a sample in our lab and were able to sequence it, identify somatic variants. Um, these variants, obviously, from a research lab, cannot be reported back to the, right, directly to the patient. So, you know, we had a validation process within the clinical lab from the sample that never left the clinical lab. Uh, and then, you know, this is kind of the, the process that most groups are undertaking. Um, there, there's a tumor boards or panels uh, meet to talk about on a case-by-case -case basis, and a report is generated and, and transferred back to the, the clinician. And so this is kind of the state. I think a lot of the clinical sequencing efforts, um, while, you know, the, the two research and, and diagnostic labs are becoming fused into one, the, 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 the outline of kind of the process remains about the same. And so kind of the the, the sad part of this was that, you know, really we only identified variants that we determined to be in interesting genes in about 30% of the patients that we looked at. Now, we were only looking at um, single nucleotide somatic variants, and so obviously if we started looking at copy number and structural variants, that, that number would increase. But then of those ones that we found were in interesting genes, only half of them were actually considered to be interesting clinically. Um, so, you know, that's, we're talking about 15% of patients had something that we felt was worthwhile to report back to the patient. And then whether that information was actually used, for, you know, is probably another, like, 50% of those was actually used clinically. Um, but nonetheless, this, this effort moves forward. Um, other groups, such as um, Eros Nyan's group at Michigan, is, is doing similar efforts. They're looking at uh, a broader spectrum of mutations and a bigger fraction of the genome um, and looking at DNA and RNA uh, to try and kind of create kind of a global landscape of somatic alterations for a patient. Um, they meet with a, 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 a board that then tries to report back the results within about a month window. Um, and so that's kind of the, the current paradigm in, in clinical cancer sequencing. But, you know, it's pretty simple to imagine a, a scenario where every sample that comes into the to a hospital, you know, a blood sample, a piece of the tumor is taken, it, you know, DNA and RNA is extracted, undergoes, you know, some broad characterization of the sample, um, you know, the, these analyses or these profiles are put into complex algorithms of analysis um, that are built on top of clinical decision support um, that's based on, you know, clinical knowledge that will continue to feed itself as we get kind of response data for these patients and kind of the, the system will feed itself um, and as it grows with more and more samples and more and more data, and we'll get more and more response or clinical data that, you know, eventually we'll have this system that could, in theory, um, you know, be, be used to, to, to change standard of care uh, in cancer medicine. But, you know, this is probably very, you know, daydreamy right now. But I, th I think the tools all exist, and it's just a matter of getting the patients and 
doing a coordinated effort to do this. Um, but then you must think of you know things like privacy and security. Um, you know, people don't want to have their, their genetic information freely available. They want to make sure that it, it stays within their medical records and it's secure, that it's not going to, to hurt them. Um, you know, obviously when you're looking at the genome of a patient, that there's going to be other things that are unrelated to the question of why you're looking at it in the first place that come up. Um, you know, germline predisposition to other diseases um, could be identified and, you know, you know, some patients want to know about that information, others don't, and, you know, do, do, do we have an obligation to report this incidental information back to identified? And obviously, you know, just looking at this vast amount of data is going to require, you know, it's, it's not something that can be done on, on a laptop within a clinical lab. It's going to require the, the bioinformatics support, um, the compute resources to handle all of this if this becomes, ever becomes something that's done for every patient. So I guess I'll, I'll close. I, I think I've covered quite a bit of things. I know there's some things I probably missed or um, didn't cover as well, but feel free to ask anything that you want. But, but basically, you know, the, the, the technology is there. We're generating tons of data. Um, you know, I think as you're going to hear throughout the week, improvement is needed across the board. Everything from um, the human reference genome that we currently use to, to align things to uh, and make calls from needs to be improved. And you know, a recent iteration was just released um, that has improved a lot of these things. Um, the algorithms that are being developed to differentiate somatic versus germline are constantly being improved. Um, and we went from a day where we were using the same algorithms to call variants across, you know, in diabetes and heart disease to now we actually have cancer-specific algorithms. Um, but, you know, the, obviously the, the hindrances I mentioned with, with tumor genomes specifically, uh, looking at heterogeneity, cellularity, and so on, are, are going to affect how you can call variants. And then finally, as we call more and more of these things, the, the, the functional annotation of these variants is going to become key. And being able to identify drivers versus passenger mutations or, you know, uh, mutations that are, are, are are giving rise to the tumor earlier on or later on or the kind of timing of mutations is going to become important. Uh, and then, you know, if this is ever to go into a clinical setting to translate all that information in some sort of automated way so that we don't have to constantly meet with groups of people and talk about things on a case-by-case -case and go over thousands of variants. And so with that, um, I believe we're on break now. Um, so I think the next session starts at 11 o'clock.